Acts chapter 9, uh, we will be uh, starting or continuing this series on revolutionary living. This whole uh, month of, or the whole summer, we are uh, in a series of the book of Acts, walking through the book of Acts on revolutionary living. And uh, we've been, amen, highlighting uh, various passages uh, in the chronological uh, layout of the book of Acts that uh, I believe it can be a very powerful, inspirational, and instructive uh, framework for how you and I, as followers of Jesus, are called to live in this moment. Uh, that uh, there is a, a need for a radical shift in how our country uh, is uh, structuring itself and the kind of priorities that are, are manifesting in themselves and, and we want to think and believe that one of the most radical things that anybody could ever do is give their life to Christ and follow his ways. Uh, I mean, really follow his ways, not just talk about his ways. You know, try to remind everybody else how they're not following his ways, but like we just follow his ways. That would be an act of revolutionary living. So I say amen. amen. So, so uh, we want to take the words of Scripture very seriously. The book of Acts, uh, as we have been saying every week, amen, is Luke part two. Amen. The book of Acts is uh, the Gospel of Luke part two. It's written by uh, many uh, assume and believe uh, the same person who wrote the book of Luke, the Gospel of Luke. And uh, eyewitness accounts really have uh, informed of the author of the book of Acts. Uh, really taking into a serious consideration uh, what Peter, uh, one of the apostles of Jesus, and Paul, who last week we learned his name was originally Saul, really chronicling how these and the early disciples uh, took the words and the experiences they had with Jesus and made this incarnational ministry, this kind of uh, uh, new expression of following God's ways just sprout up, right? And uh, they did it in a very pagan context. So it wasn't like they did it in a place where everybody was excited about Jesus. Alright, so uh, if anywhere, uh, I think this is relevant, it is for all of us living here in the Bay Area. Praise God. Uh, and you know, to be pagan is not to be uh, 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 you know, uh, in, in, in the biblical text, to be pagan is not to uh, 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 be an atheist or to, to not uh, worship uh, uh, the God of, of the scriptures. To be pagan, in many ways, is to worship everything. It was this idea that there was no one God, there was just a bunch of gods, and, and we just worshiped them all. And, uh, and, and, and it was very interesting. Uh, that we live in a time now where I think uh, a lot of us are guilty of worshiping a whole lot of gods with a small g. Amen. And forsaking the worship of the true God. And uh, again, this revolutionary act of living, I think, uh, may challenge us to take seriously what does it mean to follow uh, the God who has brought us out of darkness, that the scripture says, into this marvelous light. Acts chapter number 9, then, is where we will pick up this story. Last week, Saul was on his way killing up some Christians. God interrupted him and uh, reminded him that he needed to be changed. And uh, after his interruption, Saul went and met with Ananias, who was a follower of Jesus. And we talked about last week that God had to interrupt Ananias too. Ananias wasn't trying to fool with Saul. And I was like, Saul killed my homies. I can't get down with Saul. And Ananias, a church fellow, and a follower of Jesus, had to be interrupted and it reminds us all that whether you follow with Jesus or not, we all need time to time to be what? Interrupted. Interrupted. So uh, now we are continuing in this uh, chapter and we go now back to following Peter. Turn with me, uh, Acts chapter number 9, verse number 32. Hear how uh, the words of Scripture speak to us. Now as Peter went here and there among all the believers, he came down also to the saints living in Lydda. And there he found a man named Aeneas. Who had been bedridden for eight years, for he was paralyzed. Peter said to him, Aeneas, Jesus Christ heals you. Get up and make your bed. 
And immediately he got up. All the residents of Lila and Sharon saw him and turned to the Lord. Word of God, trust the people of God. Let us say thanks be to God. So we'll be speaking from the title topic today, Jesus Still Hears. Jesus Still Hears. Father, in the name of Jesus, I pray that you will bless the word of God that has been read for us, the people of God. I pray that you will hide this word in our hearts so we will not sin against you. And please send your anointing that makes preaching and teaching easy. Let rest upon me and the hearers of this word in the name of Jesus the Christ we pray. Let the people of God say amen. amen. Give your neighbor a high five and tell them Jesus still heals. Now, one of the most important truths that I think must be worthy of our consideration is this this idea, certainly this observation that we are all a people who because of the challenges and experiences of our lives exhibit deep brokenness. And it is important, I think, to take this point seriously uh, because quite a few of us uh, are sick, um, but we spend more of our time trying to cover up the fact we're sick than actually deal with what's making us sick. That we're living in a world that has, in many ways, uh, polluted our hearts, our minds, our our ways of thinking and our ways of believing, and we. We, we are constantly being reminded that in various parts of our lives, we are people who are deeply broken, people who have lots of challenges that require some healing. And let's be honest about it. Uh, healing is a wonderful thing uh, for all of us to celebrate most of the time when we at church, and it happens instantaneously. Ain't that how all of us want to be healed, right? It's like, you know, God just heal me right now. If God don't heal you right now, he's like, well, I guess uh, it's just not the will of God for me to be healed. But I want to suggest to you that God heals us in a lot of different ways. Sometimes God heals you instantaneously. Sometimes God spends the rest of your life healing you. Because how many know some of the things we need to be healed from uh, are also some of the things we need to be uh, deprogrammed from. Yeah. Make no sense for God to heal us instantaneously and we still have all the behaviors that have contributed to our sickness still at work in us. Sometimes we heal us about our behavior being changed, our habits being changed, our thought process being changed. How many know you can have a sick thought process and still find yourself engaging in a lot of behavior that manifests our sickness? Child of God, I want you to always be reminded of this truth that no matter who you are, no matter where you are, no matter what part of your life you're in, God is looking for you and I to be well. He's interested in our wellness. He's not interested in you, uh, you know, like having your soul well and your body sick. He's not interested in you just focusing so much on your body being well and not paying attention to the spiritual part. He's not interested in you having a, a good, you know, kind of a soul salvation, but your emotions and your mind is still sick. That the healing power of God wants to penetrate every part of our lives. And the challenge for many of us is to really appreciate the depth of our sickness. And not try to be in denial. Now what's so fascinating about when we're sick is, uh, you know, there are certain kinds of sickness that you like me, like I don't ever like to be down sick. I'll have a hundred something temperature and I'll still be trying to go to work, you know, talking my lung up, you know, all these other kind of things, you know, temperature high, sweating, and I'm like, oh, I'm okay. Like, are you sure? 
look flummoxed, right? You just look like you're about to, someone push you over, you're just about to, about to fall out. I don't know if you ever met folk who just, you know, never like they've been there sick, never like to go to the doctor. I don't like to go to the doctor. Uh, you know, and I'm, I'm not proud of it, praise God. And I'm not trying to push on you like, you know, you should go to the doctor. I'm just trying to confess, praise God, amen. Uh, that, 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 you know, you, you can be uh, so, 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 so filled with, with, you know, I don't know, a certain kind of self confidence or this, this, you know, think that you are indispensable and the world won't, won't keep going if you, like, you know, lay up in the bed a couple weeks trying to get well, amen. I don't know if you ever met anybody like that, praise God. Amen. You all know me, so I guess you didn't have that. <laughs> There's this notion, there's this idea that when you are in denial about your sickness, you block the healing yeah. possibilities yeah. out of your life. Because you're not putting yourself in a position to be made well. And realize that one of the great gifts of the gospel of Jesus, the life of Jesus, and of the ways in which the, the disciples of the book of Acts actually uh, you know, employed this gospel and uh, unleashed this gospel is that they always went about engaging in the work of healing. As they ministered to folk, they initiated and facilitated healing. And it speaks to me in uh, so many powerful and important ways that all of us, even when we're in church, we need healing unleashed in our lives. And coming to church in and of itself is not the fullness of our healing process. So when we leave church, we still got some healing work that needs to get done. That's what somebody I mean, you know, listen to me preach and listen to the singer sing for 90 minutes a week is not the fullness of the healing process of God's work in your life. Some of us got marriages that need healing, and a counselor can help you with that healing process. Some of you need to go visit some doctors and, and let them take your blood pressure, your cholesterol, and remind you how to eat all that, you know, McDonald's and all that, you know, peach cobbler and all that sugar and all that stuff is, is facilitating the, 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 the illness that is in our body, in our heart, and in our mind. And part of what I want to lift up for us today is not only is there healing that needs to take place uh, inside of the church, but the healing that we all have been exposed to outside the church is particularly pronounced. All of us, because we are fallen folks living in relations with other fallen people, have experienced very profound trauma. Experiences that have happened in our lives, some that we did not ask for, that have, have crippled us and have caused us to have all kinds of assumptions about other people and how we engage with folks, that we have experienced trauma that if we do not acknowledge and call on the power of God's Spirit and all of the many ways that God will facilitate healing, if we do not acknowledge the trauma that is in our lives, we can keep coming to church and engaging in all these kind of activities and still not be made well. Yes. Certainly with all this violence and all this, this death and all this, this abuse and all these things happening in our communities, how many of you know that you can only absorb so much of this trauma without it having an impact on us? And, 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 and it's so critical. We've been talking about the Trayvon Martin stuff, and, and, and a lot of us, you know, the flashpoint for a lot of folks, because many folks have trauma we've never addressed, and that, 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 that whole burden brought a whole lot of stuff out of us we didn't even know was there. But we gotta always remember that we don't have a corner on trauma. Amen. I was on the phone with some folks thinking to talk about the uh, immigrant experience, folks trying to get to this country because uh, they have traumatic experiences that are causing them to leave their place of birth. Trying to get legal citizenship in this country has created a whole lot of trauma for folks. But can you imagine you, you leave in a place of trauma only to be met in another place where you're getting traumatized all over Folks calling you Names and labels that diminish your humanity. Illegal. Amen. 
They can turns up that remind you that you are different than somebody else. Don't you know that all of us have a, a, a threshold of trauma that if we do not not only acknowledge but begin to deal with and process and attempt to change that, it will continue to exacerbate all the different kinds of brokenness that manifest themselves in the world. And part of what I believe revolutionary living is about for the child of God is for us to be willing not only to deal with our own trauma, but to make sure that we are agents of healing in the world. That God calls us, He saves us, He heals us, so we can be agents of His reconciliation and healing in the world. And when we do not participate in the healing work of God in the world, we continue to be the, 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 the kind of people who are always being injured with no process of enacting healing. And child of God, what I am convinced of, what I think the great gift of being a follower of Jesus is about is we are constantly being reminded that God is doing something in the world that many folks in the world are not even aware of. Yeah, yeah. And to be a witness to this work of the work of God is so critical because if you don't bear witness, then the people around you will never know. Because some folks have a whole lot of assumptions about what the Jesus is about. They think about giving the preacher some money. It's about being, you know, uh, these ultra-conservative right-wing fucking nuts. It thinks about not having a high intellectual capacity to have reason. It thinks about engaging in ancient esoteric practices that have no real meaning for today's time and place. They have these assumptions about what it means to be a follower of Jesus, but you and I must always bear witness that what it means to follow Christ is to remind people that there's a story that God is working out in the world. Yes. That you will never get exposed to unless you come into contact with Jesus. Well, have anybody here that's had that kind of contact with Jesus? Let me, I mean, he, he helped to rearrange the way you see the world. I mean, I understand that these labels and categories are unable to fully describe and I'm fearfully and wonderfully made in the presence of God. They remind me that, 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 that being an American or being a, 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 a Mexican or being a, a Chinese or being a, 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 a Canadian or being an Iraqi, all these nationalistic labels can never trump being a child of God. And that if we take this work and this word of God seriously, then I can't just put you in a corner and in a label and diminish your humanity because I'm always reminded that if Jesus died for you and if Jesus loves you, I got to love you too. And this is why, you know, we did communion around here and we, we come to the table. It's always a reminder that if Jesus is welcome and you at his table, his table, his table, praise God. The body and the blood of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. That if He is welcoming you, who am I to tell you you can't come? Give your neighbor a high five and tell him Jesus is welcoming you. Amen. So, so, so that welcoming work is part and parcel of what it means to be healed. And when we do not initiate and facilitate healing, then we all remain sick. And what are some of the responses when you're sick? Uh, we're going to be going through this mostly healthy church uh, work, and there were three, three or four ways that they talked about uh, what happens when we are sick or when we are not well. We fight, we flee, or we freeze. Thank you, praise God, for all of you to work with us. This is a great kind of way for you to start to gauge your emotional wellness. What happens, or what are the situations that come up in your life that cause you to fight? What are the situations that come up in your life that cause you to flee? What are the situations that come up in your life that cause you to freeze? Fight. Flee and freeze. Don't you know that Jesus still heals even in those parts of your life too? Jesus does not leave you broken, but he seeks to make you whole. He seeks to make you whole. He seeks 
to make you whole. One of the great things about this story today is that we see the facilitation of the healing in this young man's life who obviously was in the, the, the space of worship. He was in the environment of faith. But yet, he was still sick. And I know I've gone to the church for a while. I've hung out with people uh, outside the church for a while. I know that we can do everything we can to cover up what's wrong with us. But it don't change the fact that we got something wrong with us. Hello, somebody. Give me a neighbor high five and tell them, I got something wrong with me. <laughs> And you can't feel the wrong day, my struggle's going to be on this plane. <laughs> Amen. Amen. That's why some of us glad church is only an hour and a half. If like, it's any longer, man, you may not like me too much. Hello, <laughs> somebody. Amen. So part of what I want to submit to you today is a, a, a few kind of principles that I think may help facilitate our healing process that comes from the work of Jesus in our lives. The first thing we see in this passage that I believe is instructive for us is that first you and I must seek out our wholeness. Somebody say, seek wholeness. Seek now, understand that when we talk about healing, that it is many, many parts of our lives that need to be healed. Some of us need spiritual healing. Some of us need emotional healing. Some of us need physical healing. Some of us have relationships that need to be healed. Some of us have community challenges that need to be healed. Some of us need some racial healing. That healing is not just limited to one part of, of our lives that Jesus wants to deal with, but he wants to heal everything that is wrong in our lives. He wants to heal everything that's wrong in our lives. And spiritual healing is often the result of sin. Our inability to follow God's ways. That's all the sin is. Some of us got a laundry list of things that sin is. And let me just shrink it on down for you. Sin is not, is doing things opposite than what God says. Sin is not doing things God's way. That's it. And how many of you know that we all, you know, have some moments in our day where we don't do things God's way? Right, we at church every morning. Right, you can tell two people here. I don't know where you're going to tell them. Right you know, there are a lot of things, a lot of moments in your day. You, 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 you got, you know, you, you know, you got that angel on one, you know, was an angel on the one shoulder, and you got the little, little, little up thing, a little imp thing on that shoulder, and you, you always arguing between which one is going to have the most influence on you during the day. Hello, somebody. So, and, and it seems like it's easier to go off on people you don't like. I mean, well, that's the case. I, I want to get more grace to people I like than the people I don't like. But guess what? I know that grace needs to be given liberally to everybody. And part of what makes it impossible for us to be agents of healing or even have our own healing is that we are often in need of healing from sin, from our rebellion against the ways of God. The emotional healing that many of us need is because we've been hurt by folk. And we like, I'll never let nobody do that to me. We carry around that baggage and all that kind of stuff. Uh, some of us have physical issues in our bodies and we need healing in our bodies. And, and we know that, you know, some of this is about the way I eat, the way I don't exercise, or, 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 or all these other kind of things. And, and the process of healing, child of God, is about many times us seeking out wholeness. Yeah. Us not being okay with living fractured lives. Us being honest about where we are and who has the power to help us. Us being aware that not everybody in your life is a doctor. So you shouldn't be out there giving everybody in your life the ability to operate on you. 
our condition. He's trying to give you some principles on how the healing process is often facilitated. That God wants to speak through some folk that are in your space that can help bring you out. But if you're always surrounded by folk who don't, I mean, God could be speaking to them and they wouldn't even know. Because they don't know God, they have no relationship with God, they're not interested in God. Sometimes you got to make sure you're surrounding yourself with the kind of people that when God speaks to them and your healing in that state, they will move. When God tells them to move. They will pray when God tells them to pray. They will touch you when God tells them to touch you. They will be sitting around talking about, well, you know, it's Amazon tonight. I, maybe we'll do it tomorrow. <laughs> well, the Super Bowl's playing tonight. Maybe, you know, next week. Well, you know, I got to go to the club tonight, so I'll be figuring that out. Next. No, no. I want to be around the folks when God tells them to move. They, they in motion, praise God. When God, when God tells them to speak, oh, they got a word from the Lord. I want to be around some folks that when holiness is knocking at my door, they're available to answer it and help facilitate my wholeness. The second thing that we find in this text is that after Peter speaks to the paralysis of this man, Peter don't just tell him, all right, you're healed, but just keep hanging out there. You've had a hard life. You know, you know you had a rough, just take a chill pill. No, Peter tells him to what? Pick up your bed Listen, child of God, one of the second things that is critical in our process of healing is that we have to take responsibility and power back. Somebody say, take it back, take it back. You see, child of God, I want you to realize that when you are in a place of sickness, sometimes you are used to being the victim. You're used to having your power taken from you. You're used to the pity on others. Totally like fix it all for you. When I'm sick, you know, uh, I, 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 I turn into a mess, praise God. And I feel like, baby, can you bring some water? You know, I, can't, I don't have enough strength to get out of bed and walk 10 feet to get me some water. You know, and then, on the first day, you know, cool, yeah. Second day, cool. And I go out, like, all right. Obviously, when I'm not here, you can figure out where to crawl yourself to that fountain and get some water. Praise God. I mean, you know, when, when you sin, you used to be a take care of, you used to be a victim. But when you get well, some of us got to learn to take responsibility and power back. Because when you don't take your responsibility and your power, then you will never be the person God is calling you to be. Here we go, this child of God, but we were created by God. We were created with power. God gave us dominion. He gave us the ability to rule and to have authority. And when you are not well, sometimes you give up that authority. But when you become well, you need to be like Peter told that fella, take up your bed and walk. Stop laying around. And excuses about why you can't when God has told you why you can't. Stop looking at all the reasons uh, that are blocking you and start imagining that those are not the stepping stones that can help you get to another place where your, your walk and your life can be maximized. Take up your bed and walk. Stop giving other people the power to change your space and your Seven folk walk into the room and all of a sudden you need to just start. You, you lose your equilibrium. They walk in and you'll somehow turn into a frown. You leave the room. Anybody, you know, I'm asking y'all a little bit of honesty in here today. Anybody, you had someone walk into the room, you walk out the room? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> what has happened is they hurt you and you have given them the power. To dictate how you will respond to them. And part of what it means to take responsibility and take power back for your healing to be fully manifested is for you to not allow people to have that kind of control over you. You're not going to, you ain't going to control me like that. Amen. You come in the room, if I was happy, I would stay happy. 
don't have that kind of power over me anymore. And part of what gets in the way of us taking that responsibility and that power back is we have not learned what I believe is the number one tool in taking power back from other people. We have not learned how to forgive. A lot of us, we hold grudges, boy. I don't know if you ever hold grudges so long, you forgot what you even was mad about. Man, I mean, you've been mad at them since you was kids. You can't even remember. I just know I don't like you. Why? Cuz. Cuz. Tell them to take responsibility. And then the final 
thing that we find uh, as a gift in this passage is, is, is the last verse we read, verse number 35. It says, all the residents of Light and Sharon saw him and they turned to the Lord. Understand, child of God, that Jesus still healing us is a great opportunity for a testimony. A story of God's redemptive power and work. And I want you to know, child of God, that one of the reasons why it's so important for you and I to put on display what God is doing is because there's some folk around us who think they're always the only one. Some folk feel like I'm the only one struggling with this hard thing. I'm the only one struggling with this addiction or this life uh, style. I'm the only one struggling with these sets of issues. But God wants you to put on display what he's done, how he's healed you, the story of your redemption. That's why it's so important for you and I to learn to confess our faults one to another. A lot of us like to, you know, be healed in secret. <laughs> we don't want nobody to ever know that we're going through. I don't even ask another sign of our sickness. That we always try to hide. And it's something in the, in the garden when, 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 when Adam and Eve ate the fruit, that the first thing they did was go and hide. Because they realized that something was going on that they were ashamed of. But when you get over your shame and your guilt, you don't have to hide from anybody. And part of the process of confessing our faults one to another is that it opens up our lives to be shared. God was telling me uh, earlier that this is such an important point for our kind of Protestant, Christian, individualistic way of thinking about our faith is we laugh and make jokes about how Catholics confess their faults one to another. Oh, I didn't confess my faults to nobody. I just do it in secret. But that ain't scripture. The Bible says confess your faults. Well, I'm going to pray. I'm going to pray and confess it to myself. How do you know that it's hard to be accountable to yourself? Hey. <laughs> you like me. Amen. I, every morning I, I say I'm going to work out. <laughs> and, and you know what happens in the morning? Myself <laughs> seems to be way understanding yeah. <laughs> about why I can't do it today. <laughs> Take it it's hard to be accountable to yourself. <laughs>
this. Because in their own theological orientation, they thought that their parents could do things that would make their kids end up a certain kind of way. But Jesus looked at his disciples, all those holy folk and all those religious folk, and he looked at them and he told them, nobody seen it, that this person would be like this. But this person has this condition because I want to get some glory out of their Of 
God always seems to lead us to be active in that process. And Jesus still heals as long as we are available to be healed by Him. So to facilitate that healing. Step with us, everyone. Let's spend a few moments in prayer.